Let's get started. We'll get started. We'll get done early. Amen. All right. I want to welcome you to BBI. It's good to be here tonight. Good to be saved by God's marvelous grace. I hope that you've had a, a wonderful day. And uh, we should thank the Lord for all His blessings. God's been good to us. He has. And uh, we need Him tonight. We need His help. And let's pray for, uh, certainly for uh, those that are having revival this week. We're excited about that, hoping for a good week for them. And uh, tonight, let's open our Bible one more time uh, to the 23rd division of the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 23. And I uh, hope you have been keeping up with your uh, questions, your commentary. And uh, you have the last section of that. Uh, given to you tonight, and I uh, hope that you're working on that diligently, laboring, amen, uh, to knock that out. It'll be a help to you, and uh, let's uh, read in unison together tonight the 23rd Psalm one more time as we have read it, and uh, these six short verses, I think, tonight should be lodged in our heart, amen, and I hope that it is, but let's read it together in unison. Let's begin. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness, mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father in heaven, again in Jesus' wonderful name, Lord, we come to you now, God, as we begin our study tonight. Lord, these two last verses, Lord, we're going to try to cover this evening. And Lord, with your help, Lord, we'll be able to do that. Lord, we need you tonight. And Lord, we thank you now for Bethel Baptist Institute and the study of the Psalms, lesson number eight. Bless it now. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. Notice again verse number five, if you will. We're going to begin there tonight. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. We find here actually a transition, if you will. And the danger of death is now past. So these two verses are actually a transition for us tonight. David now reverts back to the thought of the happy, joyous time that God has promised to him. And I want to be honest with you. We're, we've got, oh, I've I got something to be happy about tonight. Maybe you don't. But I'm saved tonight. Maybe you're not, amen. I've got something to rejoice about tonight. And I realize this life is filled with sorrow and troubles. But I want to tell you, God is still good no matter what is going on in the world. I want you to notice just a few things with me tonight. Notice the preparation of the table. Our daily bread, I put it down that way. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemy. I believe we could say this is a prayer of exaltation. David is speaking to God. Amen. That's a personal thing between thou, he said thou. Who's the thou in, in David's, in the context? Who is thou? Somebody answer that. The Lord. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. God, certainly, that's correct. But thou is the Lord. He's addressing not just God, but the Lord. And the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D is the word Lord. That's exactly it. Y'all are getting it. Amen. Jehovah. Amen. Jehovah. And remember that. Jehovah. And uh, I like that, amen, I like that. The covenant-keeping God, the self-existent God, amen, and the Jewish God, Jehovah. David is talking to him personally, and David, I believe, is praying to God, and he's telling, thanking God, in a sense he is, and he's, it's, between, it's personal between thou, the Lord, and me. 
Thou preparest a table before me. And I think that we could say it this way. And if we read that this way, we could say it's personal between us and the Lord. Me and God. And by the way, I like it when it gets to be me and God. Don't you? I'll tell you, there gets to be some sweet communion there when it's just you and the Lord. Can I ask you a question? Has God ever prepared a table for you? Amen. Well, I kind of like that. David is thinking, he's thanking God here. And how wonderful it is to recognize that which we have is given by the mighty hand of the Lord God of glory. We should praise God for His blessings too with our prayers. Amen. We should praise Him in our prayer. We should thank Him. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 says this, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. But not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven and then he said pray give us this day our daily bread have you prayed that to God I I dare say most of us probably didn't get up this morning and say Lord give me this day our daily bread because your daily bread was probably already in your fridge but they had to pray it back then and you know what it may come to a time in our life that we have to pray God give us this day our daily bread can I tell you God's been good to me today. Oh my. If I were to begin to list some of the things that God has done for me just today. I woke myself up snoring this morning. I surely did. I really did. I don't know if you've ever done that or not. Amen. That was a blessing. Amen. It's better for me to wake myself up snoring than my wife wake me up snoring. Somebody say amen right there. That was a blessing of God. And the alarm clock went off in just a few moments. I rose from the bed. Amen. I was able to stumble to the coffee pot and put in one of those little Keurig cups, turn that joker on, and a moment push the button and hear it go shh. And my cup was filled. And boy, I got that caffeine. Amen. And boy, I was happy. Amen. And then I got to read the Bible. Got to pray and seek God's face. Boy, there's nothing like God's been good to me. Amen. And then I had breakfast and had some more coffee. And later on, I had some more coffee. And later on, I had some more coffee. And later on, I had some more coffee. Amen. I'm telling you, honey. God God, God has been good to me. You say you're on a caffeine high and you're crazy, amen. No, God has been good. Hadn't He been good to us, amen. He has. And boy, God, I began to think about how good God is. It becomes real when we recognize that it is God who prepares our table. Can I tell you, glory to God, everything that I have is all because of Him. He has blessed me with blessings over and and over and over and over again. He prepares the table. Isn't it nice when you go and you just go sit down at a meal and the table's already prepared? Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm not always sweet like I am to you. Amen. I mean, I give you the questions and, and give you the commentary and the answers is in the commentary. Amen. I'm nice to you guys. And over at the house, it's not always that way. Amen. And y'all hearing me tonight, and this is being recorded so you know it must be true. So every once in a while, I'll be a little snarly. You know what that is. Any of you men ever been snarly? Amen. Yes, sir. And boy, my wife knows exactly how to pay me back on that. She'll forget to get my water, amen, or pour my drink, get my silverware, get me a napkin. She'll forget about that. But isn't it nice, amen, when she has the table prepared and it's set, Brother Tony, and all you have to do is walk over and sit down, amen. Sometimes I am so lazy, I just want her to cut my food up, amen. She don't ever do that, but I'd like for it to. <laughs> Ain't God been good to us? Think about it. He has set the table tonight. God is good to us. It be, amen. Can I get a witness tonight? Has God, has God, 
has God been good to you? He certainly has. And boy, I tell you, it'll be a blessing to you when you realize it is Him that sets the table. Amen. The preparation of the table. But notice this, the placement of the table. The Bible says preparest. And that word preparest means to set in a row, to set in order. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Notice the presence of the enemies. And by the way, let me just say it this way. We're going to have some enemies in this walk of life. Everybody does not love preachers. Everybody doesn't love Christians. Amen. They don't. We've got some enemies in this world. But God does not depend upon wicked men for the preparation of His table. The enemies of God's sheep have no power to defeat God's set purposes in our life. Can I tell you, honey, the enemy is not going to keep our God from setting the table for you and for me this evening because my God... I don't know if you're hearing me tonight, but my God, I'm feeling it tonight. My God is able tonight to set the table right in the presence of the enemies of this world. I want to tell you, hallelujah to God, He's still good, He's still God, He's still holy, but He is still the almighty, supreme God who is sovereign over everything that is and over everything everything that ever will be. Amen. That's my God. Hmm. Boy, I felt preachy up here tonight. Amen. But notice this. The enemy, that doesn't, the preparation of the table, those wicked men, they don't have, they can't hinder God in any way. Amen. The glory, the God of glory cannot be stopped by the enemy. Wicked men are only men. God is God. I will illustrate it this way. A single drop of water cannot put out a burning fire even though the water has a contrary nature. The water has not the greater power. Are y'all hearing me tonight? God is powerful and neither can men stop the God of glory. Notice something else. The provisions of the table. What does he say? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemy. I put this down, the partaking of the, of the encouragement. Physically, here the table speaks of daily food and contentment. And I like to be content, don't you? I like contentment, don't you? <laughs> if you ain't content, you're miserable. Yeah, you ever seen it? Can I tell you? I've sat with, well, let me just back up. I sat with a multi-millionaire in my living room of my home two years ago. And he sat there beside me and he has all the wealth of the world. He has anything at his disposal. He bought a hundred thousand plus dollar vehicle Paid cash for it. I mean, this guy, you're talking about cabbage. You're talking about having the jack. This guy has got it. And the interesting thing is, there's no contentment. He's not happy with that that he has. And I'm thinking, money is not the source of contentment. Amen. Oftentimes, it's a source of contention. Are you listening? For the love of money is what? The root of all evil. But I want to tell you tonight, it is not found in the things of this world. Contentment, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Listen to what the teaching of the Apostle Paul and the Holy Ghost used him to write these words. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out and having food and raiment let us be therewith content. Do you know what the number one problem in America is? Materialism. And people are not content with that which they have. Will we build a house? What do we say? Well, I wish I'd have built it bigger. Huh? I wish this was a little bit bigger. When we get a stove, 
or a new set of cabinets, or a new bathroom. I wish it had been this, or I wish it had been that. When we build a building like this, I, you've probably heard me say, I wish we'd have built it bigger. I want to tell you, I should back up and say, thank you, Jesus. Oh, listen, children, you don't realize, we tore out one wall just to have this class. Did you know there's another room next door that if we need to, we can take that wall out as well? Are y'all hearing me? Amen. Be content with such as ye have, and thank the Lord for His blessings. Hadn't God, mm, hadn't God been good to you? Well, amen, I know He has. But here it is physically. The table speaks of daily food and contentment. But spiritually, the table speaks of daily fellowship and communion with God. In Luke chapter 12, verse 29 through 32, the Bible says, And seek ye not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I believe that, don't you? I believe that God wants to have us, have us to be satisfied with Him and have communion with Him and to be very satisfied in the things that He gives us. I'm glad that He has prepared Sister Lori a table today for us. The Bible says in verse 5, that thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine. Notice the next little section. What does he say? Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. I put this down. The soothing save. Thou anointest my head with oil. Now again, God is thou and David is my. Now, oil is a very interesting study in the Bible. In fact, the very first two times it's mentioned deals with a man that I'm preaching about right now on Wednesday nights named Jacob and a place called Bethel of all places, amen, and where he offered up a sacrifice unto God. Now, there are three physical qualities of oil. The smoothness to the skin, brightness to the sight, and fragrance to the smell. So it's interesting as you think about the physical qualities of oil. Jacob sacrificed unto to God. In Genesis 28 verse 18 and 19 the Bible says, and Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillow and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And you go all the way over to chapter 35 verse 14 and 15 and the Bible says, and Jacob set up a pillow in the place where he talked with him, even a pillow stone and he poured a drink offering thereon and he poured oil thereon and Jacob called the name of that place where God spake with him Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. And on in the Bible or back in the Bible we find in the book of Exodus if we were to turn back there from from Psalms we would find that God called Moses to instruct the children of Israel to give an offering unto the Lord. In the book of Exodus chapter 25 verse number 1 through verse 8 let me read these verses to you. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. By the way, if you give it, let Kent, boy, could I preach right there? When the offering plate goes by you, you give it begrudgingly. You know what you should do? You should have stuffed it in your old dirty sock on your left foot. Because I want to tell you, honey, that's about all you're going to get out of it. Amen. You better just hang on to it. If you give it grudgingly, unwillingly, without a willing heart, you just as well to keep it because you're going to need it, friend. I'm going to be honest with you. But you give it willingly and lovingly and say, Yes, Lord, I release my offering to you and Lord may it be used to bring honor and glory and I give it with a willing heart by the way God does not need your money amen he already has it he owns everything that you have whether you realize it or not you say it's mine no it's not God is only letting you borrow it for a little while now, I've already read where you come into this world and if you came in the same way I did you came in with your behind naked say amen right there 
It was a little bit embarrassing, amen? But nevertheless, that's the way we all came into this world. I don't think I know anybody that was born with a suit and a necktie around their neck, amen? And boy, if they had it, they'd have been in bad shape. I don't reckon I ever seen anybody born that way. Every single one of us came into this world without one thing, without even an article of clothing. And can I tell you, when we leave this world, we'll take exactly what we brought into it with us when we leave. Can I tell you everything? Everything that we have. Is what God has given to us. And I've seen people hold back and say, Oh, I just don't know if I can turn loose of this. The blessings of God come when you have a willing heart. I'm just preaching. Amen. And I'm preaching to the choir tonight because I think we all love to give. Don't you love to give? Huh? I said, Don't you love to give? I thought you did. I love it. I love to take up offerings. But I, I'd rather receive them. You see, when you take an offering, you you give me that offering. <laughs> when you receive it, you say thank you, and you you give a person an opportunity. I'm trying to refrain from saying take an offering. That's a bad phrase. In Exodus chapter number twenty-five, verse number two, he said, speaking to the children, they bring an offering and they give it willingly with his heart. And ye shall take my offering. Verse 3. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them. Gold and silver and brass. Blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair. And ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood. Oil for the light. You'll get that in a moment. Spices for the anointed oil and for sweet incense. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate and let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So we can say but what we've read tonight that oil had something to do with man's approach to God in the Old Testament days. In Exodus chapter 27 we will read about the pure oil that was to be made and, and that the light of the lamp was to burn continually in the Old Testament tabernacle. It was to never go out. In Exodus 29 verses 1 and 2 If we were to read there We would find that the oil was used In the making of the unleavened bread Which I believe to be a symbol Of the, a broken, of the unbroken body Or the broken body rather Of Jesus Christ on the cross In the same chapter I turn there for a moment The oil has significance in the office of the priest Turn over to Exodus 29 Let's read verse 5 through to verse number 7 Then we'll drop down to verse 20 Exodus 29 and verse number 5 And thou shalt take the garments and put the Aaron, the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod. Verse 6 And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head and put the holy crown upon the mitre. Verse 7 Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. You say, preacher, why are you teaching us all of this about the oil? We're going somewhere. Hang on. Exodus 29, verse number 20 and 21. Notice what the Bible says. Then shalt thou kill the ram and take of his blood and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons and upon the thumb of their right hand and upon the great toe of their right foot and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. Verse 21, And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar and of the anointing altar oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon his garments of his sons with him and he shall be hallowed and his garments and his sons and his sons garments with him. If you were to turn to 30, uh, Exodus 20, 30 and verse number 25 if I could read one more verse and thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment an ointment compound after the ark Art of the apothecary that it shall be a holy anointing oil. I want to say this tonight. A, an oil of the holy ointment. Rather, a holy anointing oil. And that's really what that means. Amen. After the art of the apothecary, according to Jewish tradition, these essence of spices were first distracted and then mixed with oil. The preparation of this anointing oil, as well as the incense, was first entrusted to a man 
man by the name of Bezalel in Exodus 37 29 we find that and later the care of preserving it was given to Eleazar the son of Aaron we find that in Numbers 4 16 in the later age the anointed oil was prepared by the sons of the priest in 1 Chronicles 9 30 but in Exodus 30 again verse 26 I'm going to read down through verse 31 and then I'm going to give you the next point the Bible says and thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith and the ark of the testimony and the table and all his vessels and the candlestick and his vessels and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels and the laver and his foot and thou shalt sanctify them that they may be most holy whatsoever touches whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy and thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest office and thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel saying this shall be an, an holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations can I say this again oil was used in the approach unto a holy God it's the only way that they could rightly according to the scripture approach God they had to have oil if you'll notice again let me say something else oil was used in the man in, in a man being set apart for service for the Lord you recall Saul was the first king of Israel and the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter number 10 and Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance David the second king of Israel <coughs> 1 Samuel 16, if you'll turn there. In verse number 13, the Bible says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Solomon, the third king of Israel, was anointed oil before being made king. Amen. As the Lord had been with my Lord in 1 Kings chapter number 1, the Bible says, Even so be he with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne my king of Lord David. In verse uh, 39 of chapter 1 of 1 King and Zadok the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon and they blew the trumpet and all the people said God save King Solomon can I say it this way oil was used by Jacob in the sacrifice at the altar of Bethel in chapter 35 of Genesis. Oil had something to do with man's approach to God in Old Testament's days. Oil was used in the making of unleavened bread. And without it, you would not have unleavened bread. Are you you ain't hearing me tonight. Did you know it took the oil? Oh yeah, we wouldn't have had a Savior, my friend. Oh yes, that's a great type there. Oil was used in setting apart of the kings of Israel before they took their position. But we find in the New Testament book of Matthew, if you'll just hold on just a second, and I'm going to read. If you want to turn to John chapter 12, I'm going to read in just a moment. But oil is talked about there many times. The Jesus taught the parable about the ten virgins with their lamps. Five were wise, five were foolish. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus sent the disciples out to preach and they anointed many with oil who were sick and they were healed but in John chapter 12 in verse number 1 the Bible says in Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus which had been dead glory I want to run right there had been dead past tense oh yes whom he raised from the dead and when they had made him a supper and Martha said but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him then Mary took a pound of ointment of spikener very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment then saith one of his disciples Judas Iscariot Simon's son which should betray him was this was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor then he said not that he cared for the poor but because he was a thief and he had the bag and bear that which was put in therein then Jesus said let her alone against the day of my burying has she kept this here it is that Jesus Christ the king was anointed before his crucifixion he is by the way king of kings and lord of lords I believe that don't you oh yes 
Can I tell you there's some other kings too? Did you know that? They are. The Revelation teaches us there's some kings and priests in heaven. Notice that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. But in Revelation chapter number 5, the Bible says, And beheld, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Boy, I'd love to stop right there and preach, but we will when we get to it in the book of Revelation. Notice verse 8, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vows full of odors which are the prayers of saints and they sung a new song thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof for thou was slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on earth. Can I say it this way? Oil is a type of the Holy Ghost of God. And when you are saved by God's marvelous grace we are anointed the moment that we are saved with the Holy Ghost of God. I want to tell you tonight I know Him. Amen. I want to tell you tonight there's something moving right here inside of me right at this moment and it's not me glory to God there's something bubbling inside me it's an unction from the Holy Ghost that lives within me it is the anointing that God has placed in my heart and I want to tell you it's a oozing out and it's a coming through because there is a God who has anointed his children with the anointing oil you see the Bible declares us to be kings and priests and I've done read to you if you're a king and a priest, you have to be anointed in order to hold that position. You see, God doesn't do anything halfway. And tonight, we should, we should be glad of that. David said, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. What did he say? Thou, Lord, anointest David's head with oil. Are you anointed? Do you feel the Holy Ghost? Honey, that's one of the ways I know I'm saved. I have a love for people. Amen. And especially the brethren. Amen. The Holy Ghost. That anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now notice something else. I like this. Verse number 5. and We're, we're, we're almost to verse 6. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. And then he said, My cup runneth over. I put down the surplus of supplies. The cup. Think with me for just a moment. Hospitality in the Western culture, and especially in America, is something that we lack. Know very little about hospitality. The first time I went to India... I was taught hospitality. They took us to a church that had been, uh, several of the people had been drug out of their homes and beaten, murdered, and actually their bodies were burned in the street. And they burnt their church down. They took us, and when we drove up, out in the courtyard of that church, Brother Tony, they had chairs sitting out there. and They said, y'all just sit right here and wait. We sat there about ten minutes and, here come a, a delegation of Christians. And they had pans, they had towels, and they washed our feet. And they served us out of their poverty. You say, what did they serve you? I have not an idea of what it was. We went to another church that had nothing to offer. They washed our feet. And I watched a little ten-year-old boy Climb up a coconut tree and cut coconuts and bring them back down. And he took a knife, a machete, Brother Tony, cut the top off, and he brought it to me. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I hate 
coconut milk. I hate it. It gives me indigestion. I do not like it. But I took that and I drank every drop and I thank God for it. Because they served out of their poverty. We know very little of hospitality. But in Bible times, an overflowing cup is symbolic of something. Now, I need two participants. Sister Anna, Sister Lori. Y'all would be good ones. I'm always picking on the guys. Tonight, I'm turning the table. Now, if you were a stranger, they're a lot slower than the guys, I'll tell you. <laughs> if you were a stranger, and get, stand right up here, right, right, right up front, and you come to somebody's house, the first thing that would be done for you is to be, you would be given a cup of water. Now, You come over here. <laughs> Stand right there. Okay. You would be given a cup of water. Could you give her a cup of... Give me that cup. <laughs> give her some water. Food. Yeah. I hold it over the bucket, not over the pulpit. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Now. What do you think you're supposed to do with that water? Yeah. Bottoms up. <laughs> and as you drink that water, keep drinking. <laughs> you would stand there and watch her. And you would put more water in it as she's drinking it. Don't let it. Fill it up again. As she drinks it out, you fill it back up. It's interesting. That's the way they did it. And I'm going to be honest with you, it was a blessing. It was a blessing. You would drink the cup and they would refill it. And you would drink the cup and they would refill it. And as long as they were filling and refilling the cup, you were welcome to stay. But drink it down. She's drinking it down. No. I'm going to make a point here. But if the cup was not refilled, it meant it was time for you to leave. <laughs> so long. Without saying a word. That's what you had to do. Sorry. Bye. But you know, if you were a visitor, Haley Phipps, and you come and you as a stranger, but you come and... Oh, I love this. And you got that water, and you got the cup. And she'd start filling that cup. Hold that cup up high. Hold it up high. Hey, fill it up. And she would fill that cup up, but then she'd start doing this. Keep pouring it. Keep pouring it. If the host really liked the person who held the cup and thought that person was someone very special and wanted that person to continue to stay, the host would fill the cup to full and beyond. That's beyond. Yeah. <laughs> Drink your cup. 
You got your bucket. Get your gallon. Oh. Oh. That's what that meant. Do you get the illustration? She said a lot without saying anything. She told her that she's somebody that's very welcome and that she wanted her to stay in the company. And the cup was overflowing. Amen. And boy, David, oh, my, can, can I get a. Hey, has God ever filled your cup up yeah, to overflow? Amen. To overflow. My cup runneth over is what the psalmist said. God had been so good to him. Could, could you overflow it one more time? <laughs> Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And then the Bible says in Ephesians 5, 18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Can I tell you? An overflowing cup. Now that is what God wants us to do. Are you out of water? No. I didn't think so. You see, God has an endless supply. Amen. That cup just keeps overflowing. Oh no. You see, God is wonderful. Hadn't God been good to us? Heaven, I'm telling you, He just keeps on in the business of, of our filling our cup. And the cup just continues to run over. There's time and time and time in my life that I felt empty. And I'd come to God and He began to pour and He began to run my cup over. And hallelujah, He hadn't stopped running it because He's God and because that He can. What a God we serve even through the hard times and the troubles of life. There is a God. There is a God. Psalmist David didn't know anything else to say, but my cup runneth over. Boy, isn't it good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the illustration. Didn't they do wonderful? Did you drink a couple? Well, you'll have to dip. <laughs> Let me close real quick, verse 6. <laughs> I'm still not done with the overflowing cup. <laughs> I'm so glad that my God is able. <laughs> I got time, I won't tell it. My grandchildren were out of out of town all last week. I don't know if I've ever said it publicly or not, but I love them. <laughs> Have I ever said it publicly? Yeah. And uh, Brother Tony, they were gone all week and I hadn't seen them. And I had a, a hard day Saturday. It was a hard week last week. There's a lot of preparation. There's one man like to work me to death. He's sitting in here tonight. About work me to death. Work your fingers to your bone. What do you get? Bony fingers. Bony fingers. Amen. Some of you country music fans. Amen. But that's the truth. That's what we get. Bony fingers. I was so tired Saturday night. About 5 o'clock. And I went over and everybody knows what a lazy boy recliner is. I sat back in that thing and it just enveloped me and I said I am down for the count I don't know that I'm even going to get up and go to brush my teeth I said I'm going to just camp out right here because I was wore out my wife walks over she says honey I said yes baby doll <laughs> she said your grandchildren want to see you I said, well, hallelujah. I said, send them down. She said, no, they want you 
to come to their house. And I thought to myself, I'm tired. I am wore out. But somehow or another, there was a little something in me that itched me out of that recliner. And we got in the car and we rode up that mountain. And we get out of the car and, and I'm going to be honest with you, y'all, you don't know what it's like to hear an Indian, a Native American war hoop. My granddaughter came out the door and she pop and my grandson, he usually just gives me a how you doing pop and goes to grandma, but not Saturday. Oh, he wanted me to take him. So I grabbed him and he, he was hugging me. And I mean, it was just like we'd been apart for a long time. And uh, he went out up and he pointed up to the hill. And on top of that hill, there's a swing set. And I thought, I am not able to walk up that hill. This boy weighs 30 pounds and he feels like lead. And I'm just wore up. My legs are sore. My back hurts. I'm, I'm hungry, we ain't eat nothing, and I'm wore out. And Brother Bill, he wanted to go to that swing set, wooden swing set on top of the hill. So I said, okay, Gabriel, I'll take you. And about that time, everybody else done went in the house. My granddaughter was grabbing my pants leg, and she's pop, pop. And I looked down, I said, yeah. She said, I want to go swing too. I said, good, come on. She said, uh-uh, I want you to carry me. She said, I don't want to get my feet dirty. So I have to reach down and pick her up. And I got him up. And I'm thinking, Lord, I am wore out. I cannot do this. And I walked up that hill. And I got her on the swing set and started swinging her. And the little man, he got loose over to the place where you climb up to slide down the slide. Now he's 14, 15 months old. And you can imagine, he ain't got no fear. I mean, he's putting one foot in the rung and the other one's way over here and he's climbing and going. And I'm thinking, wow, I need some help here. And all the time I'm reaching for him, my little granddaughter's over there and she's saying, Papa, I need you to swing me higher. And I was running over here, Gabriel stopped and I was pushing her. And I was running over here and grabbing him and, and all of that the whole time. Everybody else down at the house, chilled out. I started whistling. <whistles> Just as loud as I could. And my little granddaughter looked up and said, Pop, Pop, you need to learn to whistle louder. <laughs> I said, you're right. And I said, hey, hey, would you help me up here? Nobody came. Finally, I took my cell phone and texted my wife. Would you please come up here? Bless her heart. Five minutes later, she made her little way up the hill. And we had a time. Well, it got time to go in. And I thought, praise the Lord. Maybe she'll carry them both down the hill. Little Gabriel looked over at her and she went, come on, cutie. And he went, uh-uh. I pop, pop. Little Karis, three and some years old, and she looked over at Nene and she said, uh-uh. Pop, pop. And I had to pick both of them up. And me wore slap out. I'm telling you, I didn't think, I thought I was just going to roll down the hill. And we went another route. And we come by the dog and terrified him for a few moments. And we went in the house. I had to sit beside one and across from the other one. You could say it was my day. And I sat there and I thought, Lord, you sure have been good to me. My cup runneth over. Sunday morning, about 7 o'clock after we cooked chicken, I was in the shower. And I don't know why it is, Brother Tony, but sometimes in the shower is a good place to talk to God. I mean, you ain't got much to hide. I'm just being honest. I mean, you're right there. You're just nothing but you and God. And, and you're just there. And I was talking to God. And God began to tell me about a man that carried some folks up a hill. His name was Jesus. After he'd been beaten with a cat of nine tails, and his body had been riven, and they'd planted a crown of thorns on his head, they'd mocked him and beat him and cursed him, and he'd been up all night. And yet they put a Roman made cross on his back and marched him up Golgotha's hill. And you say, well, what was the, the people he was carrying? It was you and me and our sins. And up there on that hill, nobody came to help him. 
He did it alone. And you know what? Thank God, thank God. He come up off that grave, out of the grave on that third day. And I want to tell you tonight, that same one. God began to show me something else. Not only did He carry us up that hill, but those of us that are saved, He has taken us back home with Him. Just like them. Hey, you'll not get to heaven by yourself. You got... You got to have somebody to help you get there. Because I want to tell you, there's not a one of us that will make it alone by ourselves. But He promised, I'll never leave you or I'll never forsake you. But I'll go with you even to the end of the world. And boy, I tell you, God began to tell me, not only did He die for me and He carried my sins, He carried me up that hill. And it was me, my sins. It should have been me that died there. But he took my place. And thank God after he come up out of that grave, he saved my soul. And he's picked me up. And he's carried me, oh my soul, back to his house. Amen. We think heaven's our house. See, what my grandkids don't know, they're living in my house on the brushes. I live in a parsonage. <laughs> my grandkids... And my granddaughter says this is her house. What she don't know, that house belongs lock, stock, and barrel to me. It's in my name. I paid for it. Hey Amen. I paid the taxes on it. And glory to God, it's mine. But what I don't realize is I think about heaven being mine. But honey, I want to tell you, I'm enjoying the trip. And boy, it's just like it's going to be home for me. But it's all because... I Hallelujah to God. Brother Tony, it's all because there was one named Jesus who picked us up and carried us to the cross, saved our unworthy soul, and now He's carrying us right back into His bosom into a place called heaven. And it's our home, but it's His glory to God. It's His. It's His. It's His. Oh, listen tonight. If we get a hold of that, I our cup, our cup is running over. Woo. I like that. Verse number 6, and I'm through. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The favor of the Lord follows us tonight, surely. Faithfulness of the Lord never fails us. He said, surely goodness. The fatherhood of the Lord is eternal. I shall dwell. Goodness and mercy are the attributes of God. God's goodness meets our needs. Amen. His priesthood provides. Hebrews 4, 14, 15, and 16. You can read that later. But God's mercy forgives all our faults. Goodness and mercy. Aren't you glad Jesus forgives you after you've saved? Hey, anybody's ever sinned after salvation? Boy, I'm glad. First John 2, 1, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man, and can I say it, or woman sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. Goodness cares for the temporal. Mercy cares for the spiritual. Goodness leads to repentance. Mercy leads to regeneration. Goodness calls the prodigal to come back home. Mercy ran to meet the son. Goodness is God's hand. Mercy is God's heart. Goodness His person reveals. Mercy reveals His pity. The shepherd leads us. Goodness and mercy are our rear guards. Amen. And we need that. Most shepherds always have two sheep dogs. Mr. Spurgeon calls goodness and mercy two heavenly messengers. And then he said this, And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word dwell means to abide. It means to remain. It means to continue. The word house is a home. It's not just a lodging. A home for the people of God. A home in the presence of God. House means presence. Abraham looked for it according to the Scripture. John saw it according to the Scripture. And one day you and I who are saved will experience it according to the Scripture. 
If I could read those two verses one more time. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, we love you. And Lord, I sure thank you for being my God and my Savior. Father, I love you and... God, I know that you loved me long before that I ever loved you. Lord, I thank you for your bountiful table. God, that you have prepared in the presence of our enemies. Lord, I want to thank you for the anointing of oil, the Holy Ghost. Lord, I want to thank you for filling my cup. God, just refilling it and filling it till it overflows. And Lord, I'm glad that goodness and mercy are following after us. And Lord, we sure need that. We need your goodness and mercy. But one day after a while, oh, we're going to (laughs) dwell. We're going to dwell. We're going to dwell right there in the heavenly abode with you forever. All the cares and trouble, the problems of this life are going to be over once and forever. God, we're going to be in a perfect place, a perfect environment with a perfect God, and we'll be perfectly created in your image and in your likeness, I believe. Lord, I want to thank you for that. Lord, we sure love you this evening. We ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. God bless you is our prayer.